So today I thought I'd share a review on this research paper done on the environmental persistence influences infection dynamics for a butterfly pathogen, which happens to be OE for monarch butterflies. This was published in 2017 by Dara Satterfield from the University of uh, Georgia. The OE is a spore for mushrooms. They also have spores and if you shake the mushroom you can see sort of the image of the spores. Individually they're very small. They're around five micrometers as shown in this picture. So you can't see them by the naked eye but when they're together you can see them pretty well. And you can see they're very similar to what an OE spore looks like. And they are 10 micrometers. They're oval shaped or football shaped. And they tend to have maybe what looks like maybe a coffee bean type indentation. And they have this amber coating, very hard amber coating. In this particular experiment, Unfortunately, it didn't work out because there were only 16 days um, in, in the experiment and that wasn't enough. There is some interesting data to gather from this research report. On top of that, there was a model developed for the environmental persistence. But since one of the keys to the model is understanding the decay of the spores, and that wasn't obtained in this particular research report, it wasn't very useful. So a quick review of the OE life cycle. The little football shaped amber spores are shown here. They basically have to be ingested so they have to be ingested by the caterpillar. So these amber football shaped spores have to be ingested by the caterpillar. And the caterpillar is basically a stomach on legs. And once the spore is ingested, it uh, basically finds its way to the skin of the caterpillar, especially in the back portion where the fat is usually accumulated. This is sort of the beginning of the cycle. I know it's like the chicken and the egg, which one came first, right? Um, but at some point in order to get infected, the caterpillar needs to eat or ingest the spore. And the spore, where did the spore come from? Well, it came from another butterfly. Okay, so we'll just go with the ingestion of the spore as the beginning of the cycle. As we mentioned, the infection develops internally in the caterpillar. And at some point when the adults emerge, they are covered with the spores, which then when they fly around, they can uh, deposit those spores on milkweed, which will then be eaten by another caterpillar and so on and so forth. Transmission occurs when infected butterflies shed infectious spores onto eggs or milkweed leaves, and spores are consumed by the monarch larva. In the Eastern North American monarchs that migrate over 2,500 kilometers every fall to go to Mexico. When the monarchs are in Mexico, they're just overwintering. There's no real breeding happening in Mexico. It's only in North America, when, when the monarchs are in North America, that they're, they are breeding and they have caterpillars and they have eggs. That is when the OE transmission begins or starts. Um, and it generally, if you've raised monarchs, you've probably seen this, where at the beginning of the year, the infection is much lower. And as the season progresses, you tend to have more and more that are infected with OE. So one theory 
is that this pattern suggests is that these spores accumulate on milkweed over time. And if these spores remain viable, which all evidence is that they do remain viable for an extended period of time, monarchs born late in the season face a higher risk of infection than the earlier ones. I don't think they actually accumulate per se, but the life of a spore is a lot longer than what I think the authors were thinking uh, at the time of this paper. So if you've raised monarchs, you know that from year to year, you really need to clean the cages. Otherwise, you'll have a problem. At least the spore can survive about a year in the basement, let's say, right? let's say a constant temperature, humidity environment, hopefully in the um, weather, in this, you know, exposed to sun, wind, uh, rain, etc., they don't last that long. One theory is that they would accumulate on the milkweed leaves. Another would be that they not, they don't necessarily accumulate over time as much as they just remain on the host plant for the rest of the season from the one butterfly. So they remain up here. There's a mention OE spores have a thick amber colored wall that appears to offer some protection from stress. And this amber color would make sense that it would be protection against UV. If this coating could be broken down, uh, it would make the contents probably more susceptible to UV light. It could be heat sensitive or it could be mechanically displaced by wind or the rain. For this experiment, they deposited infectious amounts on milkweed plants and exposed those plants to environmental treatments, two of them, sun versus shade, and then measured how the spores would infect caterpillars over time. But, counter to their expectations, the spores showed no significant loss of infectivity over a two-week span. So in two weeks, they really didn't degrade in any way, shape, or form. From that data, you couldn't really quantify how quickly the spore would decay when it's um, subject to environmental weathering. The experiment was not sufficiently long to provide some of the parameters for the model, but they still went ahead and um, built the model. So this model could have been done, you know, without this experiment, really. And um, they examined the effect of the spore deposition rate on infection dynamics. Our modeling work indicated that the environmental persistence of at least three weeks was necessary to persist in the population through the breeding season and longer to reach the um, required prevalence commonly observed in the wild. At least 12 weeks or longer. And as, you know, from personal experience from folks that are raising monarchs, we know that this spore can really last a long time. So. Uh, you really have to disinfect your equipment from year to year to make sure you don't have a problem. So there's two assumptions here that the parasite infectivity, so this is true-false, that the caterpillar get infected, and the infection severity, which is more of an analog value, would decrease with longer environmental exposure over time and that spores exposed to sunlight and rainfall would decay more rapidly than spores shaded on sheltered plants. So those are the two scenarios. The shaded scenario is also sheltered, and the sunlight scenario is also exposed to rainfall. The spores were manually deposited on some potted swamp milkweed, and there were three strains of spores that were used. One strain called E3, another called E10, and another called E13. 
and about 200 spores were deposited on a leaf on the underside using a glass wand and the treatments outdoors were day 0, day 6, day 11 and 16 days outdoors in the sun or shade and the outdoors environment was Athens, Georgia and this was on June 6th through the 21st 2014 I went ahead and pulled the history for Atlanta Airport which is about 60 miles away from Athens, Georgia looking at the temperature trends high-low between June 6th and June 21st as well as the precipitation as we can see there was sort of a large storm or rainfall event on day zero of the experiment they mentioned six precipitation events occurred one two three four five six it would seem and the temperature ranges for that time period we can see the trends uh, which kind of reached the max around 93 degrees on June 19th and really didn't drop below 65 and since the temperature ranges sort of exceeded this ambient temperature there must have been some uh, local heating effects but there's no information on the amount of UVA versus UVB exposure UVB would probably not make it to the underside of the leaf so probably UVA would be the only factor associated with sunlight and of course there's also no information on how much rainfall just the six events although we can see that June 6th was a fairly high rainfall event and June 16th was another fairly high uh, maybe an inch of rain on the 16th at least in Atlanta so materials and methods to test the infectivity of spores after environmental exposure we fed individual inoculated leaves to lab reared monarch larva one leaf per larva in the early third instar when monarchs are large enough to consume the entire leaf yet susceptible to OE infection so this kind of raised the interesting question for me on whether the fourth and fifth instar are not susceptible to OE infection because I never realized that maybe they would be the larvae were raised in plastic containers with mesh screen lids under ambient light presumably no UV light at an average minimum and maximum of uh, about 81F to 87F probably an incubator larvae were given the fresh stalks daily 200 were reared 25 and 6 of the environments 30 for the day 0 and 20 for the control group day 0 had 30 day 6 had 25 each for sun and shade day 11 25 each sun and shade etc adding up to 200 here we recorded the signs of OE infection during pupil development for monarchs that showed no sign of infection we verified the status after eclosion so it's possible that they were not all tested for spores I've noticed some, sometimes even though there may be some spots on the chrysalis it doesn't necessarily mean the butterfly will have OE it, they were checked for infection status which is a true false or binary choice and also the severity of the infection was measured so there was a quantity of spores basically per butterfly so there was some data loss for the E13 day 6 shade and sun if we look at this chart it kind of represents a little closer 
how many plants were used these four plants and these caterpillars were removed from the data set so it made it so that day six was a little bit shorter on the number of caterpillars so in the end it started with 200 caterpillars 20 were used for controls apparently three were lost for day zero and then we had the 20 that were lost for the day six and then we have three of them that were lost for day 11 and a total of six here which amounts to 148 caterpillars here are the results so the vast majority survived to adulthood meaning that one in ten caterpillars died or didn't make it to adulthood among those that were contaminated with OE 74 percent were infected so one quarter did not get infected uh, that were given the spores exposure time did not significantly affect infectivity so that weathering of the spores really didn't change anything so 16 days spore exposure to the elements did not reduce infection and it was noticed that some spores were more virulent than others E3 apparently uh, only left 10 percent of the caterpillars uninfected as opposed to E10 which left 35 percent of the caterpillars uninfected so this is a chart sort of summarizing some of the data so day zero there were n caterpillars 27 caterpillars total and 22 of them were infected out of the 27 which amounts to 81 percent were infected but unfortunately the chart appears to show more than 81 percent for the day zero so this scale here is not exactly a hundred percent correct for for the data points here so day six uh, there were 10 caterpillars that got infected out of the total of 15 15 was the total n 10 were infected which is about 66 percent uh, which again on the chart 66 percent would be down here and on the shade side it was 11 out of 15 so 73 um, percent and then on day 11 there were 15 out of the 23 that were infected which is 65 percent so this bar should have been right around here and then on day 11 we had 19 out of 24 were infected which is close to 80 percent again but we have a little bit higher than 80 percent on the on the chart and then day 16 we had 17 out of 25 were infected which is around 68 percent and again it's showing a little high on this chart and 16 out of the 19 that were in the shade or 84 percent were infected and we also show a little high on this chart so if we look at the shade caterpillars uh, so we're talking this 11 19 and 16 we had 46 of them out of the 58 were infected which translates to roughly 79 percent infection rate which is basically equal to your day zero or 81 percent rate so the fact that it was weathered the spores were weathered in the shade had a zero effect it was just as bad as if it was day zero with no weathering whatsoever and you can kind of see that in the chart here I mean here if you just look at the shade you might see these bars increasing and think oh 
more of them are getting infected uh, as time goes on for the shade spores but it's just noise it's not really getting more infectious with time um, this is basically a flat line between uh, day zero and all the shade data now if we look at the sun data and we add them up so we have this 10 here, 15 here, 17 here adds up to 42 out of 63 or 66 percent which is roughly 15 percent less than the shade side and you could say maybe that was due to the sunshine but remember there was also rain included so it could also be due to the rain um, the rain could have washed away enough spores so that it might have reduced the infection rate so my takeaway from this data is that essentially 20 percent of the caterpillars that were getting spores did not get infected so there is another component here that is uh, at play in in this system to explain why these 20 percent of the caterpillars did not get the infection the way I would have represented this data is by showing the number of caterpillars per se so on the left hand side you sh you see the 22 caterpillars that were infected out of the 27 total and so on the left hand side you have n number of caterpillars and on the right hand side you have the percentage over the total so that was 81 percent of the caterpillars were infected for the day zero and then the day six in the sun side there were 10 out of the 15 that were infected and on the shade side there were 11 out of the 15 that were infected so you can see there's just a difference of one caterpillar between the two scenarios which um, you know you can't really say there's a huge difference between the two it's just plus or minus one and um, similarly on the day 16 the N is very similarly close and again you might see this trend of increasing as the days increase which is uh, just noise so here the only takeaway is that the infected are between 70 and 80 percent it goes from 70 to 80 uh, basically for all scenarios that means there's some caterpillars that are not getting infected by the spores probably the immune system of the caterpillar is causing them not to get infected so there's really no conclusions on the environmental spore decay that can be drawn from this data the next chart goes into sort of the more analog degree of spores on individual butterflies when they eclose based on a different exposure of the weathering of the spores here the data was looked at on a log scale which makes it a little bit easier when you're dealing with a huge number of spores sometimes it's difficult to analyze the differences without uh, maybe using a log scale so here if you look at it this way you might see maybe a trend on the sun side going downward shade side really doesn't show any trend I guess the way I would prefer to look at this is using a box plot where we can compare the medians and the averages and if you look at the day zero day zero is sort of a null case because there's no really sun shade the data was just split into two and you can see there's no difference between them anyways the median is the same the average is the same 
if we go to the next case, which is the six day exposure here, you can see maybe the sun side might have a little higher median and a higher average, meaning that the sun would cause the caterpillars to have more spores, which again is just noise. So there's really no difference here at six days of weathering between uh, between the two cases here. If we look at the next case of 11 days exposure, now we see sort of a dramatic difference. And uh, we see that the sun is lower, which is the reverse of what we saw here. Sun, lower amount of spores in the final butterfly as opposed to the shade, which has a higher number. And if you look at it, in terms of the raw numbers, in terms of spores, so this is uh, the 200,000 line here, you can see that the mean between the two are, are a huge difference. So you might say it's 300,000 mean for these butterflies as opposed to, let's say, 100,000 mean for these butterflies. So you could say that this may be a real difference after 11 days in the sun then we're starting to see some degradation of the spores and then if we look at the last data point for 16 days then the change is not as dramatic as it was for 11 days you can see the shade number is moving more than the sun number. So the sun may have reached the max at 11 days and it's no longer degrading beyond that beyond that base level degradation. Or, you know, this is noisy and it should be going down substantially, but it hasn't. You could also say maybe the shade really needs 16 days in order to see any kind of dent, whereas in the sun side you start seeing the dent at 11 days. That was sort of interesting information. And you may be able to quantify that the sun after 6 days versus the sun after 11 days, maybe there's a, a factor of 2 reduction in the spores in the final butterfly. So looking at the raw data a little bit more closely, I also split it out by male and female because I wanted to make sure that the spores, that the sex did not have an effect on the number of spores in the final butterfly. There were some shocking revelations here. For the 11 days sun females, the median was above 200,000, whereas for the males it was well below 200,000. So there was a huge difference between male and females in these two cases. And if we look at the these two cases, we're talking about 12 females versus 11 males. So it really shouldn't be that large a difference between the two. Um, unless the males really didn't get infected at all. Or for some reason the males were the ones that weren't, their immune systems were preventing the infection from happening. In my experience, it seems like the males are more vulnerable to OE than the females. And then we can see the reverse trend here with the 16 days shade. So the shade females much lower count on the spores than the males, which is above 400,000 median. So a huge difference between these two, and if we look at the 16 for shade, we're talking about 8 females versus 11 males. And then we have a third uh, discrepancy between the sun males, which have nearly zero median uh, spores 
and the females are close to a median of let's say a hundred thousand spores but a huge difference again so I'm not sure why there would be these factors here so here there's an interesting statement that we expect that the monarch's migratory cycle selects for even greater spore longevity so it makes sense that those monarchs that do migrate would have spores that can survive for a longer time uh, in the environment as opposed to the ones that don't really migrate. For those of us who are dealing with the mig you know the migratory butterflies, we always knew this that if you don't clean your cages from year to year, you're going to have a problem with OE. So here's another interesting point that, you know, where the monarchs rely heavily on milkweed plants, not only for ovipositing, but also as the primary nectar source, it's going to be a problem. So it would be good to separate those two. For example, make sure you separate you have a separate island for the milkweed for eggs and for the um, nectar sources for the butterflies. Of course, here it was interesting to see the word super spreader uh, used, especially since COVID-19, but it's uh, quite similar. You can have one butterfly that is really um, loaded with spores and be the unlucky person that that butterfly hangs out in your garden for an extended period of time. You really want to be able to catch the super spreaders, make sure they don't get loose. So it's always good to test, always test for spores, even if you think you can see from the chrysalis that it's going to have spores or not, you're probably going to be surprised that when you test it, it's not going to show that it has any OE. And it's random, right? Infection rate is random. It, it's not a fact that all of the caterpillars that are eating the same milkweed will be infected. Only a fraction of the population will get infected. And it's always a good idea to just test at the end always test so you know for sure. So here are some conclusions from this uh, research report. Between 10 and 30 percent of monarchs won't be infected by ingesting OE spores and I think this can be attributed to the monarch's immune system. The more we can do to help the immune system of the caterpillar, uh, the better off I think they will be. OE spores are viable for much longer than 16 days and most folks that are raising monarchs every year probably knew this. Uh, be sure to clean your cages 100% uh, each year to avoid problems and uh, I think currently the best way is to use bleach um, but I'm also looking at some other methods. So whether the OE spores accumulate on the leaves or merely remain infectious for the entire season on a single visit from an infected butterfly is still not 100% clear to me. It could be that the increased rate towards the end of the year is more related to an immune system issue as opposed to this accumulation on leaves. Um, rain may be as effective as the UVA radiation in reducing the spore infection rate. This study didn't really differentiate which one might have reduced the OE spores in the final butterflies. 11 days in full weather exposure may reduce the spore load by half. You know, whether it washes away with the rain via UVA exposure or exposure to heat because this was Georgia and it did go over 100 degrees, so it was pretty hot. Hopefully with global warming, we won't see that uh, in the northern latitudes.
Male versus female susceptibility to spore loading was not clear. I'm not sure why um, the data seemed to reflect some real differences between the males and females in some of the scenarios. Th this study would tend to confirm that uh, mo to monarch raisers that we still need to test all monarchs for OE. We need to know if there is an infection or not. I mean, it's easy when there's no infection, right? Life is so much simpler. And uh, so you don't need to take all the same precautions if you know you don't have an OE problem. And then, of course, you need to know as soon as you do have an OE problem to start taking a lot of precautions. And you want to especially identify any super spreaders that are developing in your cages. So uh, there is a video on ways to test for OE spores without a microscope if you need to know how to do that. So thanks for watching and see you in the next video.